Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, before we get started, just wanted to let everyone know that we are recording this lecture and we will send it out um, after tonight. If you have any questions during the presentation, um, enter them at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A box. Enter them and Dr. Schrader will take some time at the end to, to get those answered. And tonight's lecture will be given by Dr. Jake Schrader. Um, topic is tackling knee and shoulder pain. Dr. Schrader is one of our orthopedic surgeons uh, who sees patients in our Doylestown and Chalfont offices. All right, thanks so much. Um, my name is Jake Schrader. Uh, like she said, I'm just kind of getting started at Rothman. So it's a great opportunity for me to uh, give a little talk and uh, educate on uh, knee and shoulder pain. So. This is just a, a picture of A.J. Brown for all the Eagles fans out there for the game tonight, uh, avoiding a tackle. Uh, so a little bit of outline of uh, what we're going to talk about. So <clears throat> um, kind of four different parts. Start out talking generally kind of about orthopedics, what an orthopedic surgeon is, kind of what I do. Um, and then we'll kind of transition a little background about myself, uh, where I'm seeing patients. And then we'll talk about some common uh, shoulder complaints. Um, elbow complaints as, as well as uh, some common knee complaints. Um, so what does an orthopedic surgeon do? Um, you can see this cartoon, um, you know, it was just Halloween. Some people dress up for people in the medical profession. So I don't think many kids know what an orthopedic surgeon does. And I don't know if, you know, patients know, my, my mom didn't know. Um, so pretty much an orthopedic surgeon um, is in charge of the musculoskeletal portion of the body. So that includes bones, muscles, joints, and ligaments. Um, I actually used to work with a, a guy that would introduce himself by his first and last name, and then he'd just call himself a bone doctor. I think that's a little bit uh, easier for people to uh, to understand sometimes, but um, there is more to it than just bones. Um, so sports medicine. So I, I did a, a sports medicine fellowship. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm kind of seeing a little bit of everything. So I'm, I'm, I'm a generalist uh, with a sports medicine background. Um, so during training, you know, everybody gets um, exposure to kind of all parts of the body and you know, a certain comfort level, uh, depending on where you trained and how you train, kind of treating a little bit of everything. Uh, more and more, you know, the, uh, the model is moving towards subspecialization, but, uh, you know, most orthopedic surgeons in general do have, uh, you know, background in, in pretty much everything. Um, so sports medicine doesn't really uh, encapsulate a body part per se. You know, some people say I'm a shoulder surgeon or I'm a spine surgeon. Sports medicine doctors kind of see a little bit of everything. So shoulder, elbow, knee, hip, um, kind of depending on their background and their comfort level. Um, you know, some people say they don't want to see a surgeon. It's also confusing because there are sports medicine doctors that don't do surgery, uh, but there are also sports medicine doctors that, that do do surgery. Uh, so the whole goal of kind of what we do is um, kind of getting patients back to um, doing what they want to do. Uh, so again, some people might say, you know, I'm not an athlete. I shouldn't see a sports surgeon. Um, so this is, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is what people think they should look like. And then, you know, sports surgeons are treating um, you know, pretty much anybody. And this is just an example of somebody, you know, with rotator cuff disease that um, is often seen by a sports surgeon. Um, there's also the, the idea of like minimally invasiveness um, that's, you know, always in vogue. People want to have minimally invasive surgery rather than large open surgery. So, um, you know, part of sports medicine, arthroscopic surgery is kind of small surgery through um, kind of little, little incisions, um, you know, the hip or the elbow or the shoulder or the knee. Um, that allow it to be a little less invasive. Um, so this is just uh, some depictions of different types of arthroscopic surgery. So you can see on the left, um, this is uh, an example of arthroscopic knee surgery where you introduce uh, instruments and cameras through small incisions um, where you can kind of look around corners um, in the various joints. So this is the knee and then you know, the bottom right is an example of shoulder. And then the top right is just uh, an example of kind of where you would make your incisions for an arthroscopic knee surgery. Um, so again, this is just um, one example of kind of sports shoulder, um, kind of what it encompasses. So you can see all the different types of shoulder procedures, all the different types of knee procedures. Uh, so some of these are performed through, you know, camera with small, small incisions. There are other um, sports related procedures that are done through large open incisions. Um, you know, for arthritis conditions, um, this just lists shoulder replacements, um, which is something that I enjoy doing, but also hip replacements and, and, uh, knee replacements as well. And then, um, you know, obviously fracture care, uh, everybody breaks bones. So orthopedic surgeons are good at, at fixing fractures, whether it's upper extremity or, uh, lower extremity, uh, fractures. 
Um, so anytime somebody, you know, presents to the office, um, for a, a consultation, you know, the, the whole goal is to listen to the patient and kind of figure out what your goals are. Um, you know, what's bothering you. Sometimes people say, you know, their hip hurts when it's really their back or their shoulder hurts when it's really their neck. So part of the, the role of, uh, my job or any orthopedic surgeon is to, um, you know, listen to you kind of use the information that's given to us both by what you're telling us by our, our examination, um, you know, any imaging or outside studies that might, might help us make those decisions and then kind of work together with you to make recommendations. Um, so the, the idea of shared decision, decision-making process is important. So, you know, you shouldn't come in to have me tell you, you know, this is exactly what we're going to do. It's a little bit of a give and take to figure out what's, what's best for your situation. Um, so a little bit, um, <clears throat> you know, in a nutshell, the whole uh, spectrum of treatment options um, can kind of be applied to, you know, a variety of different um, ailments for, for people that present to the office. So uh, benign neglect or doing nothing is always an option. Um, you know, people like to do things to make things better, but oftentimes if you just give it time and kind of modify your activities, um, the problem will get better. Um, this evolves into, you know, uh, less invasive things like, you know, oral medications, physical therapy, different, uh, braces. Um, and again, you know, like I said, modifying your activity, your lifestyle, a little bit more of an invasive option, um, would be injections. So there's a variety of injections, whether it's steroid injections, um, or what have you <clears throat> that can help, you know, improve your symptoms and oftentimes, um, improve your, your pain, um, acutely to allow you to, to benefit from some other options such as physical therapy. Um, and then there's, you know, obviously surgeries and there's minimally invasive surgeries and open surgeries that we talked about, um, all the way up to, you know, large joint replacement surgeries. So, um, part of our, our job is to figure out, um, what you've done, what you haven't done and kind of what, um, stage your disease is at, what, what would, uh, benefit you the most. Um, so that was a little bit about orthopedics. I'll talk briefly kind of about myself and my background. Um, so like I said, I just started, um, this fall at, at Rothman, um, in Bucks County. Um, so like I said, I'm a, I'm a generalist. So I see, you know, a little bit of, of everything, do different joint replacement surgeries, fracture work, uh, some, you know, basic hand, um, as well. Um, but I did do a sports fellowship last year. So, you know, people always ask you like what your favorite joint is. So my, my joint of choice is probably the shoulder, you know, whether it's arthroscopic, uh, surgery, uh, open stabilization procedures, um, as well as, uh, anatomic and reverse total shoulders. Um, so my week, I'm, <clears throat> split between uh, Doylestown, both the hospital and the ASC there, as well as the office. And then one day a week, I see patients, um, the Chalfont office as well. So um, mostly be at Doylestown, but also um, occasionally be at Jefferson Lansdale. Um, so this is just a picture of the <clears throat> ambulatory surgical center um, on the Doylestown campus. Um, so our office uh, where we see patients is on the second floor. And then the surgery center um, is on the top floor. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a Rothman physical therapy center and then as well, um, a Doylestown physical therapy center as well, um, kind of all in this new building. It's just opened within the last few years. So it's, um, really, you know, a nice facility, both the office and the, uh, the operating rooms. Um, so a little bit about me, <clears throat> I was actually born in South Africa. Uh, my parents are American. They were working there. So, um, born in South Africa and as, as, you know, a two-year-old moved to Pennsylvania, grew up in York, PA. Um, so you can see the York peppermint patty, you know, original home of the York peppermint patty, um, ended up going to, uh, Bucknell university in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, ran, uh, track and field as well as cross country all four years. Um, and then, uh, actually lived in Germany for a year. I studied economics in German at, at Bucknell, um, did an exchange fellowship in, in Germany, took some language classes and then ended up going to, uh, Jefferson for medical school in Philadelphia. Um, and then <clears throat> did my, uh, five-year residency in the Lehigh Valley, um, at St. Luke's and then just spent a year of, um, additional training in sports medicine or arthroscopy, um, in San Diego, which was a wonderful, wonderful year. <laughs> um, so a little bit about me and we'll kind of transition to some shoulder and elbow complaints, um, that are common presentations of the office. So kind of a little bit of background, um, you know, obviously musculoskeletal injuries are, are very, very common. Um, there's some studies that say up to 40% of complaints uh, for patients that present to their primary care doctor uh, are related to musculoskeletal injuries. Um, so this has, you know, uh, 
effects on, on pretty much everything, you know, daily activities, people aren't able to work, they're not able to earn money, there's social ramifications as well. Um, you know, people enjoy social activities, uh, people run in groups, they play recreational sports. I know people are um, playing pickleball more and more often, we see a lot of pickleball injuries in the office. Um, so totally uh, understand, especially as a former athlete, uh, the inability to be able to do things that you want to do both uh, personally and then from a, a social standpoint as well. Um, so <clears throat> kind of a basic outline for this. We'll go over a little bit of anatomy and then talk about uh, shoulder dislocations, uh, rotator cuff tears, uh, rotator cuff disease, and kind of the spectrum of what that encompasses, um, as well as uh, the dreaded frozen shoulder and then uh, shoulder arthritis. Um, so <clears throat> the shoulder joint has the greatest range of motion of any joint in your body. I always compare this or contrast it to the hip joint. So the hip joint is uh, a very constrained bony joint, you know, limited motion, um, whereas the shoulder joint is not a very bony constrained joint. It relies a lot on soft tissues. Um, so because it has a high reliance on soft tissues, there's the potential for um, a lot of soft, soft tissue injuries, which is, you know, usually why people present for shoulder pain. So uh, there's a variety of joints, kind of part of the shoulder girdle. Uh, so the glenohumeral joint between the glenoid and the humerus, that's actually the shoulder joint, what people refer to as the shoulder. Um, the AC joint um, is the connection between the chromium and the clavicle. And this is uh, what's injured when people say they separated their shoulder. Uh, sternoclavicular joint is kind of more the midline of your body. And it's the other end of the clavicle where it uh, connects to the sternum. And the scapulothoracic joint isn't really a joint, uh, but it's kind of the connection between the shoulder blade scapula and kind of the uh, thorax or kind of the posterior ribs and spine. Uh, so again, like we mentioned, an uh, analogy for the shoulder joint is um, like a golf ball and a golf tee. So you can see there's, you know, for all you golfers out there, you know, you just kind of look ridiculous when you set up for a shot and the, and the ball kind of falls off the tee because it's a little angle there. You didn't have it on there quite right. Um, so that's similar to the shoulder joint because there's not a lot of bony congruity. And this is compared to, uh, this, this is an example on the left of kind of like a, a hip implant that's very constrained. Um, and, and there's a lot of connection between the two components. So uh, because there's greater range of motion, there's less stability and more potential for soft tissue injury. Uh, so again, a little bit of anatomy. Here's kind of the, the, the bony anatomy. Um, and then kind of looking at it on the inside, you know, the variety of ligaments, um, your corticoclavicular ligaments and your AC ligaments are um, the ligaments that are disrupted when you have a, a separated shoulder and your clavicle kind of rises up. Um, your CA ligament is another ligament that's often involved in uh, rotator cuff pathology. And then on the left, you can kind of see um, all the soft tissues that kind of encapsulate the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint, uh, both the labrum and then there's capsular tissue and then the, the rotator cuff tissue um, kind of on the outside of that. Um, so again, these <clears throat> this is just kind of showing you the, the different muscles. You can see the biceps tendon kind of coming up the humerus. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but there's a, there's a bursa sac or you know, fluid-filled sac that helps um, kind of with, with two objects in your body that are in a lot of motion, kind of helps lubricate and uh, prevent some friction. This can oftentimes get inflamed uh, in rotator cuff disease. So the deltoid is kind of the outer wrapping um, of the shoulder. You know, bodybuilders, you can see athletes, you can see their deltoid very well. Um, so this is kind of the most superficial structure. Um, again, this is peeling the deltoid away. You can see the long head of the biceps coming up the bone and then um, that bursal tissue that we talk, talked about earlier that can, can oftentimes become inflamed. Um, so when we talk about the rotator cuff, uh, what, what does that mean exactly? So there's four components to your rotator cuff. Um, you have the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, uh, teres minor, as well as the subscapularis. And there's all kind of cardinal motions that are associated with each. So the supraspinatus is the abduction or allowing your arm to kind of rise up away from your body. Uh, infraspinatus and teres minor are usually responsible for external rotation. And then subscapularis is the muscle that's responsible for internal rotation of the shoulder joint. And that's kind of what you learn basically. But in reality, the, the goal of the rotator cuff is to keep the, the ball centered on the socket. So anytime you have rotator cuff disease, sometimes it can affect your motion because um, the ball isn't as stabilized as it, as it could be otherwise. So again, this is a depiction of that subacromial bursa that we keep talking about. And you can imagine if the arm is raised up, 
it could potentially be pinched between the acromion bone and, and the, the humerus bone. Um, so this can lead to some inflammation of the bursa as well as the tendons in that space. So moving on to like shoulder instability, um, this is typically a disease that affects you know, younger patients, um, particularly in athletes. So this is a, a picture of Kevin Love, um, place the, the Cleveland Cavaliers, but he had a, a a shoulder dislocation that disrupted um, his labrum required surgery um, several years ago. Uh, more recently, um, you know, last year when I was in San Diego, Fernando Tatis Jr. is a, a baseball star for the Padres. Um, and he had kind of constant shoulder issues, subluxation, dislocations, and tried to play through it. You know, there's different braces you can wear, but he really wasn't himself. Um, so ultimately he ended up uh, requiring surgical stabil stabilization of his uh, shoulder instability. Um, so recurrence risk. So the earlier you dislocate your shoulder, um, the more like likely you are to dislocate again in the future. Um, and there is some, some data to, uh, support the idea that if you dislocate your shoulder, you're at a higher risk of developing, uh, degenerative joint disease of the shoulder kind of later in life. So this is kind of from an anatomy standpoint, what happens when you do, uh, have a dislocation of your shoulder. So the labrum kind of acts um, almost as a gasket kind of around the glenoid. And as the ball kind of slides out of the socket, it can disrupt the connection between the labrum um, and the glenoid. And oftentimes there's uh, capsular tissue that's associated with it as well that can kind of pull it away. So this is kind of, you know, anytime you dislocate your shoulder, this is, you know, likely what you're going to see when you get advanced imaging. Um, so typically it's, you know, related to a traumatic episode, you can have, you know, car accidents, that kind of thing fall. Um, but there's typically some sort of trauma that, uh, causes dislocation and the apprehension test is kind of the classic example. When your arms placed in that position, you kind of feel apprehensive, even though it's, you know, where it needs to be, it's a little bit weaker and you kind of feel like it might pop out the front. Typically when you dislocate your shoulder, the, the, the ball kind of pops out the front. Um, so <clears throat> when you do have surgery for, you know, shoulder instability, um, the goal is to kind of repair that lesion that we talked about kind of back to the bone. Um, so this has evolved quite a bit, um, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years it used to be kind of a, a, um, a bigger procedure. Now you can do it with, uh, you know, anchors that are put into the bone and then there's sutures attached to the anchor, um, that you can kind of repair the tissue, uh, historically people, uh, tie knots and a lot of people still do, but there's newer technology now that, um, uh, doesn't require knots, um, which can sometimes you know, be a little less irritating to the tissues. So impingement syndrome or tendonitis or bursitis or, uh, what, what have you, there's a whole bunch of different names for it. This is that phenomenon that we're talking about where you can see here the the shoulders kind of lifted up and there's like a pinching effect between the, uh, the, the two bones and the tendons and the, the bursa get them involved and in they're inflamed and can cause pain and dysfunction. So this is kind of what's referred to as uh, impingement syndrome. Um, so risk factors for this, typically this is a disease of, you know, older individuals, anybody over 40, 50, 60, um, typically most noticed with uh, overhead activities. So kind of reaching uh, either above, you know, something on the top shelf or reaching behind you and bony spurs that used to be, you know, much more commonly thought that it was partially caused by these bony spurs. Uh, but I think it's a little bit more controversial these days. Symptoms, like I said, overhead activities. Um, big thing that we always ask is if you're having pain at night, that becomes a little bit more of um, something that you want to investigate, work up, potentially operate on if it's really disrupting your sleep. Um, and then, you know, decrease range of motion um, because of pain, but then you also have to discern whether there's pain or weakness um, because if there's weakness, then oftentimes there's, you know, a rotator cuff tear that might be amenable to surgery. So these are the two classic tests for impingement, uh, Nears test and Hawkins test. And these are kind of positions um, that kind of cause those two bones to come in close contact with one another to, to cause pain and dysfunction. So uh, these are x-rays kind of of uh, the undersurface of the acromion. Um, and you can kind of see on the right a little bit better, there's like a little bit of a hook. So this was kind of the, the thought process that when you have a curved undersurface of the acromion or a hook, um, when you kind of bring your arm up 
this can kind of dig into the bursa and dig into the tendons and tissue and cause some irritation. And, you know, typically in surgery, if you have a big hook like that, you kind of shave it down. Um, but it's become a little less popular of like a standalone procedure whereas you know, years ago that used to go in and only shave that down. Um, but not, not so much anymore. So goals of management, you want to reduce inflammation. So you can do that, uh, minimally invasively with like, you know, just oral medications or steroid injection. Um, this can help calm things down, allow you to benefit from therapy. Um, so ultimately therapy is, um, uh, probably gonna be the best thing outside of surgery, like long-term, um, you know, there's 17 different muscles that attach on the, the shoulder blade, and then you have the rotator cuff tendons as well. So if there's subtle imbalances, this can kind of throw the whole thing out of whack. So, um, uh, therapy is kind of a mainstay of treatment for evaluation and then determining what needs to be, uh, strengthened, um, to improve your symptoms. So operative treatment. So typically, you know, if people come in, you know, just because you have a tear or dysfunction doesn't necessarily mean that you need surgery. And a lot of people come to surgeons expecting surgery, but, you know, I think part of our, our job is to kind of try everything, um, before you get to surgery to kind of exhaust those options. Uh, cause a lot of people do get better without surgical intervention. Um, so you want to, <clears throat> so with surgery, you want to, you know, address any sites of impingement. Um, you can kind of debris or, or remove inflamed tissue and then look and see if there's a tear that's amenable to, uh, repair. Um, so, you know, just to reemphasize, like we said, while there are motions, of the rotator cuff, the, the whole goal is to kind of keep the, the humeral head centered, um, on the glenoid to allow some of the larger muscles like the deltoid to kind of, uh, move the arm in, in space. Um, so again, you get have traumatic episodes. Um, you know, if you are in a car accident or you have a fall and all of a sudden you can't lift your arm up, um, you could have, uh, sustained like a rotator cuff tear that's preventing motion in your arm. Oftentimes you want to address those sooner rather than later, uh, just because if you wait too long, sometimes there's issues like the muscle atrophying, um, to the point where it might not be amenable to a repair. Uh, but more typically you have, uh, you know, chronic rotator cuff tears, you know, as you get older, the tissue isn't as, as hardy as it was when you're younger and <clears throat> is more prone to degeneration. So depending on the studies you read, you know, people in their sixties, for example, anywhere from like 25 to 50, 60% of people can have uh, some degree of rotator cuff tears, but obviously not all of those people require surgical, uh, intervention. Uh, so again, symptoms, you know, pain at night is the big one and weakness. So typically if you come in and you're just having pain, but you're not weak, um, you know, I'm not as concerned, you know, I'm not going to immediately order an MRI all the time because then, you know, there's a good chance it'll get better without, um, surgery just with physical therapy. So weakness is kind of a big decision point in my mind. So here's some examples of imaging, kind of a, a normal uh, x-ray of the shoulder on the left. And then on the right is uh, an example of a normal MRI where you can kind of see, you know, the black tissue of the rotator cuff tendon is nice and healthy. Anytime it becomes gray or there's streaks of white, um, you know, th those are signs of tearing or, or degenerative changes. So these are examples of uh, diseased tissue. <clears throat> so you can see on the left, um, kind of partial tearing. So you have bursal sided tears or articular sided tears, depending on where the tear is. Um, and then on the right, you can see the white, it's nice and black. And then you see, you know, the bright white is uh, a full thickness rotator cuff tear. So again, big thing you want to restore function and reduce pain. Um, you know, for chronic tears, we, we kind of talked about, you want to do everything possible typically before you get to surgery. And then if it's traumatic, you're a little bit more aggressive with, uh, uh, surgery. So these are just some, some pictures of, of different ways to repair, um, the tendon. So typically you insert some sort of anchor into the bone and then there's uh, sutures, you know, kind of similar to the, uh, instability surgery. And then you can use these sutures to, to repair the tendon back to the bone. Um, so we've actually gotten really good technically at repairing these and kind of the next step will ultimately be trying to figure out how to, how to make the tissues heal a little bit quicker, uh, because that's kind of the, the limiting step right now. Uh, so moving on to, uh, frozen shoulder, um, or adhesive capsulitis, their synonyms. Um, you know, this is a, a very common, common, uh, reason why people come to be seen in the office. So there's different phases of this, uh, typically early on, uh, you just, you have pain and loss of motion. So you're stiff and painful. Um, and then typically the pain improves, but you still don't have good motion. And this whole process can take, you know, one, sometimes two years to, to completely resolve, which can be really frustrating for patients. Um, so risk factors, typically, 
Um, you know, the textbook example is like a middle-aged older woman um, who has a history of diabetes or diabetes in their family. Uh, sometimes after surgery, you can get stiffness um, just because of the trauma and inflammation caused by surgery. Um, other endocrine disorders or thyroid disorders or, um, you know, prolonged immobilization. So if you have an injury and you're not moving your arm, that can also uh, be a risk factor. So typically uh, x-rays and MRI aren't the best at diagnosing this. Uh, sometimes the MRI can be sort of helpful, but typically it's a clinical diagnosis um, where your active and passive range of motion, typically an external rotation are the same. So even if I'm cranking on your arm, pushing on it, I can't get it to go any further. And that's just because the, the tissue um, has become inflamed and, and really tight. So there's different phases. You think about uh, freezing, frozen, thawing stage. Um, and the, like I said, this can be a, a long and drawn out process. So typically um, the main safe treatment is uh, physical therapy. And you want to make sure that you're doing uh, stretching exercises and not strengthening exercises. That can be you know, a problem if people just go to therapy and they think, oh, it's a shoulder, it's a rotator cuff injury, and they start th uh, strengthening it. That can be kind of counterproductive to uh, improving your symptoms. Um, and then anti-inflammatory medications, sometimes steroid injections can help the pain, but it typically doesn't help, um, with improving your range of motion. And then sometimes, you know, if nothing else works, sometimes you can go in with surgery and kind of release the tissues, but, um, this isn't always super successful because you're kind of already prone to this inflammation scarring. So surgery typically causes more inflammation and scarring. So it is a, isn't always a super effective option. Um, so for. <clears throat> arthritis, um, you know, something else that I enjoy treating. Um, so you can see on the left is a normal uh, shoulder x-ray. And on the right, you can see cardinal signs of arthritis, including loss of the joint space and some inferior uh, bone spurs that can limit your motion. So big thing is loss of motion, pain. And again, uh, pain at night uh, is concerning. <clears throat> so you can try, uh, you know, all the things we talked about, non-operative treatments, typically injections can sometimes help. Um, but if it continues to progress, you're not getting better and you're limited in your day-to-day -day function, then shoulder replacements are, are really good at, at treating pain. Um, so this is kind of a cartoon depiction. The cartilage gets worn out. You develop these bone spurs. And then, um, this is just a, a diagram of, of kind of what it looks like to have your shoulder replaced. So kind of cut off the, the head of the humerus and you replace it with like a metal piece. Um, this has a stem there, there are more modern um, implants now that are stemless, it's, it's just the top is metal. And then typically you put a plastic component on the glenoid. Um, to, and like I said, really effective at, at treating pain due to arthritis. So the left is an x-ray of an arthritic shoulder. And then on the right is an x-ray of a shoulder replacement. So just a little bit about the elbow. Uh, so common elbow complaints of bursitis, epicondylitis, uh, ulnar nerve symptoms, and then uh, tendon issues as well. So epicondylitis is kind of inflammation either on the outside or the inside part of your arm. On the outside is um, typically referred to as tennis elbow. On the inside is golfer's elbow. Um, and these are kind of the origins of your uh, flexor tendons or your extensor tendons. And typically it's an overuse injury, you know, classically either tennis or, or golfing. Um, so this is kind of the area of lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, kind of where you'd have most of your pain. Um, so conservative treatment, you can, sometimes people get relief with these braces, um, usually physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medications are kind of the mainstay. And then injections are kind of controversial now. Uh, sometimes you get like one corticosteroid injection. They used to be much more liberal with the use, but there's some evidence to suggest that it's not really the best long-term solution. And then there are some like newer biologic options like PRP, where they take your blood and spin it down and inject that in with some healing factors from your body that can sometimes improve your symptoms. Um, but insurance doesn't always pay for this. So it's usually an out-of-pocket expense. And then ultimately, if you know all else fails, then you can go in and kind of debride the tissue, uh, plus or minus a repair. Uh, so we'll move on to some knee, knee problems. Um, so just a quick uh, anatomy review. This is kind of a cartoon uh, picture, and then we'll go through some, some other diagnoses. So um, you have your cruciate ligaments in the middle. So cruciate being cross, so your PCL and your, your ACL are in the middle. And then on the sides, you have your collateral ligaments to kind of provide some additional stability. So your lateral collateral ligament, and your medial collateral ligament, and then the meniscus, um, kind of acts as a shock absorber and that kind of lives between the two knuckles of the bone. 
Um, it's also another common site of pathology. Um, this is just another cartoon depiction um, showing all the structures in a, a little bit of a different way. You can see the cartilage a little bit easier here um, as well. Um, so obviously lots of muscles, lots of things going on around the knee. Um, so that a lot of sites for potential uh, pain and dysfunction. Um, so ACL tears. Um, so ACL is responsible for controlling translation and rotation of the tibia. Um, typically, the, the most common presentation is a non-contact pivot injury. So somebody twists their knee. You know, typically an athlete, a wide receiver makes a cut running a route and then they feel pop. Um, the knee gives way a lot of immediate swelling and you're, you're really not able to bear, bear much weight immediately. So obviously athletes are, are at risk, um, soccer, basketball, football, lacrosse, what have you are all, um, sports that put, put you at an increased risk of, you know, some of these injuries. Um, so kind of, you know, this is kind of a general, uh, excuse me, kind of a, a, a general way to think about, uh, Treatment initially, whenever you have an acute injury, kind of the rice that everybody learns in their kid, you know, rest, ice, compression, elevation, uh, oral anti-inflammatory medications. Um, and then you obviously you want to work on regaining motion when you're able to. And then, um, you know, if you're still unstable, obviously you don't want to prevent further falls or injuries. Um, so you come in get the story. Obviously <clears throat> you want to treat the patient and the imaging. So even if an image says you have an injury, you know, if your knee isn't stable or, your exam tells you something different. You kind of have to take all the information, put it together to come up with um, a solution. So just because you have an ACL tear, there you know there's data. Especially as you get older, people can do very well with with an ACL tear if, if they just rehab it. Um, so that's that's always an option. Doesn't necessarily ne necessitate uh, surgery. Um, so these are MRIs <clears throat> on the left of a normal ACL. You can see kind of the the diagonal fibers in the middle are very distinct um, and running from the, the femur to the tibia. And on the right, um, you can see those fibers are, are not distinct at all. Um, and that's an example of a, of a torn ACL. And again, this is a arth cartoon depicting arthroscopic surgery of the knee, and then kind of showing you how you'd reconstruct uh, the ACL with um, you know a ligament. There's a variety of options running from the femur to the tibia. So graft types. Uh, historically, kind of the gold standard is a, a BTB patella tendon where you take two bone plugs and then the central third of your patella tendon, and then you use that um, to reconstruct the ACL ligament. Um, you can also use hamstring. Uh, recently, quad, the quad tendon has become a popular uh, graft choice. And then uh, you can you can always use an allograft, particularly as you get older, and you might not be putting as, as much demand on your knee. Um, you can use a cadaver graft, uh, with, with pretty good outcomes. Um, so, I, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses for all of these. And, and that's kind of a conversation you have in the office. So ACL rehab, um, uh, is a long drawn out process, typically, you know, nine months before, you know, athletes, even like professional athletes at the highest level with all the resources are getting back to, you know, a high level of, of sport. Um, so it is a long drawn out process. It's not, not a benign rehab process. There's some evidence that, um, you know, you can do some rehab to prevent uh, an ACL tear. So typically younger women are at a little bit higher risk. It just has to do with some of the angles of their hips and kind of how they land and pivot. Um, so this is um, just kind of showing you the difference between, you know, how you should land a pivot and kind of a position valgus and abduction that would maybe increase your risk of a tear. So other ligaments in the knee, um, your MCL, uh, it's very common to, you know, as a knee sprain and you have pain along the inside part of your knee, typically this is treated conservatively without surgery. Um, sometimes if you have a really bad tear, this can be reconstructed, but typically they heal pretty well. Um, and then the PCL and the LCL. So if you have an isolated PCL tear, typically it's from, they call it a dashboard injury. If you're in a car accident and your, your knee hits the dashboard and your tibia is kind of driven posteriorly backwards, that's kind of the, the classic way that you have an isolated PCL tear. And they can do very well um, without surgery. Uh, but if you start to have more than just an isolated PCL tear, then typically you, you, it's a multi-ligamentous knee injury and you, you, you want to try and repair those. So the meniscus, um, this is you know, a depiction of the meniscus. And then obviously you can see the tear. Uh, so like I said earlier, it, it does function as a shock absorber. Um, you know, the, the concavity and convexity of, of the knee joint um, don't always line up. So 
uh, this kind of acts as a, as a gasket or a shock absorber to help improve the conformity of the joints. Uh, so again, classically, if you twist um, and hear a pop, you know, that, that can be a, a common presentation for a meniscus tear. Um, so you have pain, swelling, you know, if you have an effusion or fluid, fluid on the knee, um, and then kind of sensations of instability um, or mechanical symptoms. So this is an example. Obviously, you can see on the left, very swollen fluid in the knee. On the right, um, not a lot of fluid on the knee. These are examples of different uh, types of tears. Um, you know, <clears throat> lots of times you can't repair tears that well, especially as you get a little bit older. Um, and most of the time you go in and kind of shave it back to a stable border, but they come in kind of all shapes and sizes. So people always ask like, hey, could this be a meniscus tear? Uh, so as you get older and you develop arthritis, kind of becomes the question of was the meniscus tear first or was the arthritis there first? So if you have some level of degeneration and arthritis and then you sustain an acute injury and are diagnosed with uh, a meniscus tear, you know, sometimes those are amenable to surgery. Typically, if you have mechanical symptoms like locking, catching, or popping, but the goal is then to get you back to how you felt prior to that acute painful episode. Um, there's no arthroscopic or minimally invasive surgery for the knee that's going to make you feel 20 years younger. So that's always an important conversation to have with patients. So again, lots of people uh, with meniscus tears don't require surgery and kind of do all the things that we've talked about previously. And then, you know, if all else fails, you can kind of go back and, and uh, trim the torn edges of the meniscus tear, but typically um, if you have mechanical symptoms. So again, this is an example of instruments into the knee. You kind of put scissors or a shaver in there and you kind of trim back that, that torn edge of the meniscus. So this is a, a picture of... Um, arthroscopic surgery in the knee and you can see this flap kind of moving around. You can envision how that piece might be moving around and causing some catching, locking, catching of, of, of the knee. And that's why you go in and kind of prevent that sensation. So you do that by removing it with scissors or a shaver. Patellar instability, if you, if you have a, a knee dislocation or a patellar dislocation, usually it, it, it dislocates laterally. Um, usually it's um, seen in, in younger patients, typically uh, teenage girls. Um, so activity modification, you want to try and get it back into a stable position. Usually the first time um, this happens, you, you rehab it. And if it continues to be a problem, then um, you can uh, have surgery to kind of reconstruct the torn ligaments and provide more stability. So this is an example of the tear. Um, and then the, the reconstruction is, is, is on the right. Patellar tendonitis, um, jumper's knee. Um, pain at the, the, at the very bottom of the patella, and this can be very difficult to treat, uh, typically, you know, jumping activities like basketball. Um, so the treatment is typically rehab, 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 and more rehab. Um, and then when all else fails, um, sometimes you can go in and cl clean it up and, and repair the tissue, but the variety of um, injections, usually you don't want to try steroid injection, but uh, there's some evidence that the PRP injections that we talked about can, uh, can sometimes uh, provide some benefit. And then arthritis, um, you know, wear and tear of the knee joints um, comes in, you know, all shapes and sizes and varieties. So you can have very focal damage to the cartilage, but more commonly as you get older, it's, it's very diffuse throughout the knee joint. There's not a good of like minimally invasive options um, for fixing that. So left, uh, an example of kind of normal x-ray of the knee, you know, well-preserved joint space between the two knuckles of the bone. And then obviously you can see the comparison to the arthritic joint where there's really no space uh, between the bones, bone on bone. There's some spurring and some, some that white is called uh, sclerosis or sclerotic changes, meaning like hardening of the bone. So all kind of hallmarks of uh, arthritis. Um, so all the treatments, you know, typically same thing, start with minimally invasive and work your way to more aggressive treatments um, and kind of everything in between. Um, and this is an example of um, kind of a focal deficit. So if you typically younger patients, but if you have a focal um, chondral defect in the cartilage, there are different procedures um, that can, can fix this. So this is just an example of um, osteochondral allograft. So you actually take a corresponding piece of bone from a cadaver um, and then secure it into that space um, on your bone. And it actually has really good, good data long-term. So this is another picture of kind of an open procedure. You can see the, the defect, the very focal injury in the cartilage, and then kind of the snowball uh, repair where they, they took 
kind of two circles of cartilage from a uh, um, cadaver and, and placed it in to kind of fill that void and it kind of heals in that way. <clears throat> so fractures are very common, um, you know, something that, you know, most orthopedic surgeons feel comfortable uh, treating depending on, you know, where it is on the, on the body. So, you know, they're always non-operative options, uh, typically consistent with casting and bracing. Um, and then obviously if you need surgery, then, um, you're talking more of like a plate and screw or sometimes a rod. So this is an example of a clavicle fracture. Um, you can see the two ends of the bones are obviously separated. And then on the right, they use a combination of plate and screws to kind of, uh, get the bones back into uh, proper anatomic location. And this is an example on the left of a, a distal radius fracture, you know, very common injury. Uh, sometimes you're able to successfully reduce these and then put it in a cast and hold it in that position. Um, but if you're unable to, then uh, surgery is an option. And, you know, on the right is an example of plate and screws to kind of help secure the, the distal radius fracture. And then this is uh, an example of an ankle fracture, um, you know, both on the outside and the inside part of your ankle um, fixed with a combination of plate and screws. So pretty much in summary, um, the role of the orthopedic surgeon is to get you back doing what you want to do. Uh, just because you see a surgeon doesn't necessarily mean that you need surgery or that he's going to tell you that you definitely need to have surgery. Um, so it's definitely a little bit of a, a back and forth decision-making process between both the surgeon and the patient. Um, so then, you know, if you need any more information, uh, this is my website and picture. Uh, hopefully we have a little bit of time to address any questions um, that people might have. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Schrader. Um, there are some questions in the Q&A box. I don't know if you want to bring that up or I can read them. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see here. So what type of knee tear is described as the horseshoe tear? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know if I've ever heard of a horseshoe tear. Um, a bucket handle tear is maybe what you're talking about. If you can imagine like, um, you know, a, a bucket with a handle and kind of how you can flip the handle back and forth. Um, so if you, if you imagine, um, you know, there's a piece that is uh, flipping back and forth like this handle, sometimes it can get stuck in the middle of the joint. And that can cause, you know, some of those mechanical symptoms that we're talking about, like, um, you know, getting stuck kind of in mid-flexion and you're either totally unable to extend your knee or you kind of have to shake it before you're able to extend it. So that might be what you're talking about. Um, but I'm not entirely sure what a, what a horseshoe tear means. Um, let's see, would a, would a meniscus tear repair make you more prone to further DJD? or knee replacement. Um, so the whole idea with the meniscus is it functions as a, a shock absorber. So they talk about like hoop stresses. Um, so it kind of distributes, distributes the, the force throughout the meniscus. And anytime you disrupt the meniscus, that force distribution is also uh, kind of disrupted. So um, there's been a lot of studies kind of more recently uh, encouraging more aggressive treatment of um, meniscus root repairs. So that's kind of in the very back of your knee, particularly the medial uh, meniscus provides a lot of stability. So if, if you lose the root, you, it's kind of not functioning in the way that, that you should. So there's some, I think data to suggest that if you're more aggressive with uh, fixing a root repair or a root tear with a repair, that you might be able to improve um, kind of long-term function of the knee and hopefully stave off some degenerative joint disease. Um, but I think the, the jury is still a little bit out on that. Um, similarly with like ACL tears, there's not really any good long-term data to suggest that if you have your ACL repaired, you prevent, um, you know, degenerative joint disease as you get older. Uh, but it's more about just maintaining stability of the knee to allow you to kind of get back to activities that you want. Uh, let's see. So after rotator cuff repair, would you advise limit tennis or other overhead activities. Um, I, I think I found that, you know, you can kind of counsel patients and tell them, you know, what might benefit them the most, but the hardest thing to tell patients is kind of how to modify their activities. Um, so I think there's a difference between, you know, if you're, you know, a Federer and a doll or, you know, you're a high level tennis player, you're probably going to be, you know, putting a lot more force through, through your shoulder with overhead activities. If you're really just, you know, kind of casually playing, uh, probably not a problem. So it's kind of tough to discern that, but patients really don't like 
to hear what they they can or can't do. I feel like you tell them and then they kind of make up their 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 own decisions. But yeah, typically, uh, you know, overhead activities are going to put more stress on your rotator cuff. And then um, with an ankle fracture, do you ever remove plate and screw after it's healed? Um, you can sometimes. So uh, typically, it's not like a, a routine uh, part of the surgery. Uh, depending on the type of surgery, you know, particularly over the lateral aspect of your ankle, you can, you know, there's not a lot of soft tissue covering the bone. Uh, some of the the plates, especially older plates, are a little bit more uh, high profile. They're, they're trying to make them as low profile as possible now. Uh, but after it's healed, sometimes that can cause some irritation, or you know, you might bump it and, and cause some pain. So if it's healed and it's it's symptomatic, sometimes you can remove it, but I don't think you would routinely remove it. Similarly, sometimes if you uh, have they call it like a, a syndesmotic tear and you put a screw in some people will routinely go in after it's healed to take the screw out um, but again it just depends on the the type of surgery you're having in the in the discussion you have with your surgeon uh what are your thoughts on stem cell treatments and rotator cuff tears um so i think the the notion of a, a quote unquote stem cell is a little bit of a fallacy like there there isn't really uh, treatments available that are, are really stem cells in the United States. I know the radio all the time you hear about stem cells, um, but kind of the term that's becoming popular is uh, orthobiologics. Um, so this typically encompasses like PRP, um, which is, you know, you have a little bit of your blood drawn, you kind of spin it down in a centrifuge and they separate, separate out certain parts of the blood. And then you inject it back into a site that's injured. Um, with the idea of being that there are growth factors that will stimulate healing. Um, there was a lot, a lot of enthusiasm that kind of waned a little bit. And I think it's kind of starting to come back. Um, so in, for certain indications, uh, you know, it, it can be helpful and there's some good data, but uh, insurance companies aren't, aren't paying for it. Um, so then it becomes an out-of-pocket expense. And then it's, you know, is it really worth it if it doesn't work? And that just becomes a, a discussion that you have to have with your, your doctor. Um BMAC is another uh, kind of promising thing where they, it's a bone marrow aspirate where they take, um, you know, uh, fluid from, from the middle of your bone and there's a lot of good growth factors there. So uh, I've worked with some guys in the past that, that, that do that occasionally and put that in at the end of, you know, rotator cuff repair or ACL reconstruction. Uh, but again, it's just, you have to be willing to accept the cost with maybe not all the benefits. Um Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you saying that it's an excellent presentation. <laughs> um, I had PRP done in early October on both knees. Is taking anti-inflammatory meds now counterproductive? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. If, um, you know, I'd be interested to know how the PRP worked. Um, you know, some people are starting to do it for arthritis now as well. Uh, but I think, you know, over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medications, um, is probably, you know, still something that you can have in your back pocket. Um, you know, if you really get into the nitty gritty about PRP, it kind of does stimulate some inflammation. So I'm not, I'm not sure if the anti-inflammatory effect would be counterproductive. That's a good question. Um, I'm sure that it kind of depends how, how long after, um, you've had the injections. I'm sure, you know, it's not always going to be counterproductive, but maybe immediately after the injections, but to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and then does AVN of shoulder cause problems with replacements with healing or further deterioration? Um, so AVN in the shoulder, hips, kind of anywhere else uh, throughout your body, um, it's just kind of like a, a mechanism for kind of accelerated degenerative joint disease or joint dysfunction. Um, so, you know, it's a common reason to have replacements. Um, so I, I don't think it would cause any problem to get the replacement if you have AVN of the shoulder. The AVN of the shoulder might've caused the arthritis and then the, the solution might be a replacement. And then, uh, it looks like that's, uh, that's it, unless anybody has any other questions. All right. Thanks, Dr. Schrader. Great presentation. Uh, again, everybody, we will be, we did record this and we will send it out to everyone who registered, um, who attended or, or could, who couldn't make it on. Um, I did put in the chat box that you do all have my email. So if you do have any questions that 
pop up after we log off. Feel free to email me if you're interested in a consultation with Dr. Schrader at either our Doyle Sound or Shalfont locations. Again, please feel free to reach out to me and I am happy to help set you up. All right. Great. Thanks again. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.